um, did his uh, doctoral work um, actually in India at um, the Indian Institute of Technology, is that correct, Delhi? That's right. And then went on to um, do postdoctoral studies with a person who I consider, and I think most people do, as the father of the lithium batteries. This is Stan Whittingham, who is now a professor and um, Nobel laureate nominee, actually, um, at, at Binghamton University. Now, um, Chalish has done a lot of things. I mean, he looks relatively young, but when you look at his CV, you just wonder how in the world can someone this young do so much? Um, he's done a lot of entrepreneurial things. I would argue that one of the highlights is um, being one of the inaugural winners of a $500,000 prize from the um, so-called 76 West um, competition. And I think he's leveraged that uh, prize award to create this exciting new company, C4V. And judging from the title of the talk, I think we're going to learn a lot about C4V. Yep. Uh, we're going to learn something about their aspirations and hopefully some idea about, um, this is still warming for whatever reason. Hopefully some idea about um, how Shailesh is going to uh, put this into practice. I can see the thing is on, so I'm not sure what. Um, Oops. Is it you? No, it doesn't stretch, but I think all good. <coughs> Thank you, Professor. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. So, um, as described, basically what we are trying to do is build an ecosystem around energy storage uh, and particularly lithium and battery industry in and around Binghamton. Okay. So myself, Shalesh Upreti, and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of C4V, that's a technology startup and also leading initiative for uh, Giga Factory in Endicott, New York. Um, today's talk, not knowing about the audience and, you know, uh, I was a bit uh, kind of, it, it, it couldn't decide what type of content it should have and decided to go hybrid way. So it will have a little bit of science, little bit of startup struggle and some uh, more angles to the commercialization activities that we have been doing for last seven, eight years. So uh, uh, the way I, I usually prefer, I, I gave similar talk yesterday in Binghamton University. So feel free to stop me in between. I think uh, I would like to make it uh, interactive. So uh, any slide you want me to uh, dig deeper or, or talk more about, I'm happy to do that. Or you can always ask questions towards the end as well. So that said, uh, as you can see from the title, uh, what we are kind of uh, putting together is a cohesive uh, approach and that to build the ecosystem as I was mentioning, that includes the, not only the industrial partners, the supply chain or the technology, but, but intellectual uh, brains, people, smart people like yourself. So it's, it's putting together a team um, of uh, human resource, that, that's the first thing because team is the key and team is the one that makes everything happen. And so my talk going to be focusing a little bit about that uh, to begin with. Uh, there are always a relationship between the industry and the academics as uh, primary or fundamental research start with the basic fundamentals at the molecular level or even the theoretical level. So ideas that develop in our, in our mind, uh, they go through certain processing, then we take them to lab and then lab has to, at, at some point, and uh, not every research, but at some point applied research has to go through a trajectory and a path and these paths are, are different at different stages of the invention and each each step in that phase or that growth has different challenges. So I am not going to focus every possible challenge but I think I, I would like to share some of my own experiences so that is probably is more meaningful. Um, in, in and around Binghamton if you are aware and I do not mean to market Binghamton here but I think this is where we have been working and uh, I, I, want to, I wanted to correlate it with us and I know that a lot of this infrastructure also exists in here in Cornell. I have used some of the facilities here as well in past. So uh, on the right hand side if you see uh, or left hand side from your side it is uh, Binghamton University where the basic research starts right and that is how uh, all my learnings working with Stan, Stan Whittingham, the fundamentals, the, the technical pedigree uh, in and around lithium and batteries started there. Then there are certain uh, facilities, the infrastructure, be it the analytical facility, be it the testing tools or uh, the incubators that help you on the business side uh, and the growth of the company and, and more on the marketing uh, and, and commercial uh, side of the invention. 
that has to go through certain steps. So, uh, I'll, I'll highlight some of those steps that we had gone through, but in, in particular lithium and battery, uh, as it's a very complicated mechanism uh, when it comes to manufacturing, uh, also heavy capital investment requires. So, there are not many uh, factories uh, in, in the United States right now. There are few selected ones that are producing materials. So, 90 percent of the manufacturing, if we exclude Tesla, happening in China, Korea, Japan. So, we, ha we have a, I would say, a big challenge to not only just set up a factory, but create this whole ecosystem from the supply chain, from component and, and the intellectual knowledge. So, that said, the, the, right, the, the right hand side, which is Imperium 3 I am highlighting, it is going to be the first uh, gigafactory in, in New York um, and uh, we are talking about 1 to 2 gigawatt hour in, in phase 1, th then take it to 4 gigawatt and eventually 15 gigawatt hour uh, by, by 2025. So, uh, that said, uh, again, um, I think I, I want to highlight a uh, few uh, interlink between academia and industry that uh, starts from the basic research and taking that basic research to you know giving it a applied shape and developing IPs and developing uh, products prototypes and then eventually the mass production. So, uh, C4V has been a kind of a key catalyst in, in uh, pretty much uh, everywhere in, in, in the staff all the way from uh, bottom to top of the pyramid. So, we, we had uh, started our career with uh, basic research uh, about uh, seven, eight years back, uh, solving some of the fundamental issues. Uh, we, uh, we, didn't break, we didn't break anything or disrupt anything on the supply chain or manufacturing. That's, that's, that's what we tried to, you know, we understanding the customer issues, understanding the manufacturing issues and developing molecules around it is what we were focusing on. So, uh, that said, if I am pretty sure most of us uh, here uh, understand how lithium ion battery works and uh, the basics of a battery and so I am not going to get into the science, but uh, the key is there are four components. Uh, if you look at the cathode, anode, uh, electrolyte and separator, these four components control the majority of the performance. So, how long a battery will last, how long can you drive your electric car, the safety aspect of it, uh, the, lo the longevity of the battery, everything goes back to these four components. Although in a battery you will see more than 35 components, but these four uh, control most of the performance activities of a battery. And C4B primarily focusing on cathode and anode. So, we go at the material level, um, there are uh, partners that are working with us for the rest of the components, but uh, and again we are not trying to solve every possible problem that exists today. So, we have our own way of solving whatever we can within our limits. Uh, there is a uh, kind of a path that I have put together where I, I think that either you go through these four steps or you fail and that is not just uh, you know my hypothesis or, or my own observation and I think uh, through various discussions with end users, the customers, the, the industry and uh, also we acquired a company that invested uh, about 350 million dollar and, and, and actually could not sustain uh, within two, two and a half year they had to file chapter 7. So, so there are some examples why so some of these companies fail uh, in US, uh, we are the, not the first one trying to build the factory. So, so whoever have failed, there has to be some learning from there, so that we do not repeat the mistake and, and so these all 8 points highlight that. So, it also highlight how a research from a very basic or the applied work from lab uh, can be taken to the market. So, in our uh, scenario where we uh, primarily our initial goal was to develop the technology and not get into manufacturing ourselves. So, when, when that started, we wanted to demonstrate the benefit of our molecules at the system level, how to fine tuning the molecules perform better at the, at the battery or at the system level and obviously, uh, when you are talking about IP, you have to go through all the intellectual property, um, you know filing processes to uh, demonstrating how that IP is unique. and and obviously, you have to also build the product. So, build your prototype and, and work with customers, collaborate. So, if you look at um, uh, the op optimization of performance has to be in collaboration with customer and that is how we actually started to begin with. Now, the battery industry, uh, I am using probably about 3 year old data, but if you look at the, the size of the industry, it is significant. Every one of us carry at least one battery, if not 2 or 3 or 4 these days. So, whether it is a cell phone, whether it is a laptop, whether the electric car and now in our homes the, the solar and, and wind or the renewable energy storage or the backup systems in, in our labs and homes, uh, it pretty much uh, industry is moving towards lithium ion battery. And 
the reason lithium ion is uh, is dominating the industry or, or growing very fast is there is no alternate available practically commercially there is no alternate available. So, I also call it the future replacement of diesel and petrol because for next 15 year I do not see anything commercially that can beat lithium ion battery. There are, there are certain other technologies I am not saying it is the only one, but I think this is among the top candidate to replace some of the uh, other uh, you know old technologies or internal combustion engine or storage uh, uh, technologies alone itself. So, uh, having said that um, the size has grown almost double in last 3 years um, what I am showing 22 billion is is pretty old data in a way um, and our goal is to build the first factory uh, here in New York and it should be live by 20, 2019 or 2020 at most uh, producing uh, 1 gigawatt hour uh, locally and and I would I would come back to that how we are different and what we are trying to achieve, but uh, our biggest uh, um, challenge was how to solve some of the key problems that exist uh, at the material level or uh, at the battery level first. So, the two components as I said cathode and anode that we started working on. So, we have uh, we have about 30 plus patents we cover entire globe our patents have been issued in many countries we cover almost 30 plus countries and uh, two key patents and then sub patents there there you know it is a kind of a IP tree and if you, if you include that we have pretty much about 100 plus global IP portfolio now and, and a good portion of that has been issued. So, that is an indication that the IP uh, is unique it is a, it's a solid from from protection point of view. Then we also have to demonstrate um, that uh, at the at the uh, product or the system level uh, eventually. Uh, there are certain uh, problems that exist uh, in patent landscape as well as in industry um, in terms of how even a working pa a product or a technology that has been proven uh, at the battery level or, or the system level taken from there to mass production. So, uh, before I get into that there are th if you look at the patent landscape there are th 3 or 4 type of patent I, I have not mentioned the fourth one here uh, are you know very common. So, patent you can patent, patent a process, you can also patent a, a product by process or you can also patent composition of matter. Sometimes you can patent design uh, for many applications. So, so uh, if you look at and compare that uh, I would say the, the composition of matter patent in that whole landscape are the most solid patent. So, when you when you patent a molecule or the chemistry or a composition is considered the most robust and most solid patent. Now, irrespective where you use it, how you produce it uh, and the design of your whether it is a factory or where, uh, the product does not matter you have to have the license for that. And out of all the patents filed in, in USPTO or internationally only 0.5 percent are, are composition of matter. So, that probably gives you the sense you know when we gone through all the screening process we, we fall under that category. So, now, now you have a, a, a good IP, uh, but uh, the harvesting the value of that IP is another challenge. So, uh, the challenge for us was uh, first is how we integrate that in, in existing manufacturing footprint or in existing uh, infrastructure. So, the good part or the good uh, I would say the advantage of our technology was we were able to come up with processes that are drop in. So, which means you are not disrupting anything on the manufacturing floor. There have been decades of investment in the ecosystem in the supply chain and the moment you start disrupting it, it, it creates hurdles for you to, to get to market faster. So, so, we have been able to somehow manage that hurdle and, and uh, partner with companies that have been supplying to the industry right now and, and, and we look into 1 plus 1 3 scenario. So, uh, they companies that are looking for cutting edge technology to, to speed up their production or speed up their or, or increase their market share and, and identify screen and then obviously, get into the closer partnership with them. So, we had gone through that uh, uh, whole uh, exercise in last 7, 8 years. Uh, our, our key, let, let me talk about the, the IP itself a, a few slides. Uh, again I, as I mentioned earlier I would not be talking too much about the science, but I think uh, that is something we can discuss uh, whoever would be interested I can uh, go little deeper as, as and when needed. Uh, the two IPs one on the cathode side is called biomineralization technology. So, if you look at uh, the example is actually taken from human body. So, we our body which has lot of mineral balancing lot of electrochemical activities I am not 
biologists, but a little bit of understanding in terms of how when we pinch, when we poke, there, there are signals sent to the you know, brain and, and the activities, the electrochemical activities happening regularly uh, every second, every picosecond in our body. So it's, it's a kind of a battery. In addition to that, what body does is it does very good job in balancing the, the minerals uh, ratios, the, the other type of requirements that body has and balancing it out and, and you know kind of <coughs> discarding whatever not needed. So that is the best example how a ideal battery could function or could be made and we in fact took a material that, that does that in our, our body. It is called hydroxyapatite if you are familiar with it is one of the inorganic uh, material found in human bone. So it is in fact I think the most um, by weight or by volume the highest content in our, in our body. So it is a calcium mineral. Now what we have done is we have synthesized that in the lab. Uh, we have also modified it. So, it is not exactly the hydroxyapatite, but the benefit of hydroxyapatite, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you look at uh, into daily, you know, our day to day examples like uh, people with cavity problem when they visit dentists, they uh, always prescribe uh, toothpaste with the, uh, that is rich in fluorine, right. So, what fluorine does, it, uh, it ion exchange with certain. Uh, you know ions in, in the hydroxyapatite system and make the system more stronger. So, the mechanical stability of the system increases and similar thing kind of happens in the battery. You have uh, uh, the solvent or uh, in fact the salt in electrolyte that is a fluorine base. The moment it reacts with water or moisture it forms hydrofluoric acid and you as you all uh, know hydrofluoric acid is, is one of the most toxic uh, acids known. So, it start corroding and start killing components the battery. So, as you cycle charge discharge your battery and as it had uh, the side reactions happening start forming the acid and, and you know your battery eventually die. So, if there is a if there is a way or mechanism to capture that fluorine or avoid the hydrofluoric acid formation that is just one example. That is so this is kind of how the whole biomineralization technology uh, to begin with uh, started and eventually we were able to. Uh, basically dope it at the molecular level at the crystal level. So, we are not just talking about having few of these chemicals mixed with the cathode, it is a co-crystallized and it has uh, crystal level interaction. So, it is a part of the super cell. So, it, it has then at that point it, it start behaving very differently. So, one is capturing the fluoranion, but then if you can stabilize the crystal structure because there is a lot of breathing happening in, in, in your battery when you are charging and discharging. Uh, we do not see it because it happens at the very narrow scale. So, uh, if you observe and there is a way to avoid uh, the breakage that happen uh, at the crystal level during that breathing process, your battery going to last longer uh, and that is one example. Also, when you charge your battery to higher voltages, that also put a lot of strain uh, in your crystal system. So, if there is a stability or pillaring agent that can kind of protect that breakage, that will also give you higher voltage advantage which means higher energy density uh, in, in some cases. So, the, the most popular material that used in as a cathode in our iPhone, uh, everybody uses it and it dies by the by the time you, you hit your bed. So, everybody is frustrated with the power you know the energy storage capacity of our smart systems. Uh, and, and But despite one of the oldest material used uh, called lithium cobalt oxide uh, in our batteries, we are only able to extract 50 percent of the capacity that it can deliver. So, theoretically it can give you two day lifetime without making any changes, no material change, just taking it to higher voltage. If you charge it to higher voltage, it will give you two day uh, uh, you know lifetime for, for your battery. So, so, if there is a way to protect that breakage and take it to higher voltage, you can squeeze more energy out of the battery. So, that is how the whole biominerals and technology started. Um, then we have composite silicon, silicon again known for its high energy density. The challenge is it, it, it breaks as you uh, as you make it react with lithium. So, uh, and every time it breaks it has to form a new surface. So, every time new surface is formed you lose some lithium. So, so if, if, if silicon is used although you can get higher capacity, but you will not get good cycling because every time you lose the lithium. So, we have come up with a mechanism where we uh, instead of using pure silicon we use a combination of certain elements. So, and doping and coating is involved and then also you do the particle engineering. Uh, so, where the, the, the expansion or the contraction happen within the, within the particle and you do not see overall expansion in the system. So, so that said uh, I would be going through some of the examples. Uh, I think I already spoke about how you can fine tune uh, if, uh, if there are viruses in the battery uh, that are creating side reactions or killing the performance of battery I call biomineralization as an antivirus in the system. So, uh, and we all are probably familiar with the most popular materials in, in, 
in lithium and battery landscape. There, it's starting from olivine to layer to, to uh, spinel systems or composites. Um, what happens? Each of them bring uh, different performance uh, matrix when they are used as cathode material in lithium and batteries. Uh, from their voltage performance to the lifetime safety. And two most popular materials that are that exist around us, whether it's a, a Tesla car or whether it's I, or a phone or, or any, any device that uses lithium and batteries, are the olivine and the layered oxides. So these, I think these combined together control 90% of the global market. Uh, so uh, one is very good in terms of its cost, uh, it's a safety. The other one is very high energy density and also high power. Uh, now, what will be ideal scenario is if there is a if there is a material that is best of both, and we were able to uh, we are able to achieve that through our um, approach, you know, where we could integrate the biomineral, which also gives mechanical stability and safety aspect to the material. So, so there is a there is a material that uh, we call BMLMP. Uh, it, it has certain advantages. Falls. Uh, it, it is close to uh, the layered oxide in terms of energy density, and it's it's almost uh, in terms of safety uh, close to the olivine structure. So it has, I would not call it a magic uh, material and solving every problem, but I think it is fairly good uh, combination of your cost and performance and it has best of certain uh, materials that exist today in uh, commercial market. So now with that, um, usually we do not get into uh, the fundamental work like why it is working and, and, and go deep in, in terms of studying the molecular level interactions and what is happening, why it is working better, but we have done fairly good work um, to understand uh, what biomineral does at the crystal level, molecular level, enough that we can understand the behavior of it uh, and not make it a fundamental research because we do not have resources uh, and we, we are limited by our bandwidth and, and, and capacity and capital. So, so we do enough work that we have indication to develop the material. So, but I am sure uh, a lot can be done and we are we have partnered with few national labs and universities that are working on our material in, including the theoretical uh, simulations uh, about the local structure and how it affects it. Uh, here are some of the performance metrics, how you can fine tune the material. So as you can see, uh, we, uh, if we kind of come look at the, look at all the commercial material available in the market, we have the highest voltage uh, uh, per cell, the average voltage we can extract from each cell. So it's about 3.9 volt. Uh, if you look at LFP, uh, that's 3.2 NMC, 3.7, 3.75 NCA. So we are about 3.9 volt, higher voltage also means lower number of cells to, to get the same voltage level which is important in the industry. Um, we can fine tune that again for high energy, high power, longer life. Uh, here is one of the quick example of the large commercial cell. So after 1000 cycles in at various temperatures, we only lose 10 percent of the capacity. So that means the battery will last pretty much about 3000 cycles. And, uh, and once when you discard the battery after 10 years, still better than brand new lead acid which is the closest competitor to it. So, so you can pretty much use it for 20 years in stationary market or stationary applications. So, so that is just an example for one class of material. Then we have also worked on um, some higher voltage systems, uh, how you uh, basically if you look at uh, the spinel system uh, which is also called 5 volt material. Uh, uh, the problem with that is as you go at, at 40, 45 degree centigrade start uh, decaying pretty fast. So uh, right inside there uh, an example how at higher temperature you get uh, very good stability uh, during cycling. Then we have also worked on the, the most popular one uh, called lithium cobalt oxide and uh, we, we did some in situ uh, safety uh, comparison between uh, the biomineralized and non biomineralized material. So, uh, if you look at the uh, differential scanning calorimetry, the blue color indicates, uh, you know, not only the, the heat release is less, obviously it is not perfect example, perfect scenario in a battery, but I think uh, we can correlate that. Uh, we also see the electrochem the behavior, the change in the electrochemical, the redox potential of system uh, uh, as you integrate the material. So it is not just uh, uh, behaving as a coating agent or just as a protector, I think it, it is participating. In the in the electrochemistry. Again, uh, there is a third party test. This uh, this uh, test was done by uh, DNVGL uh, under a special program where, when New York uh, in New York City, uh, Con Edison that provide utility to New York City started installing batteries in in buildings. Uh, 
then uh, New York Fire Department stepped forward saying, okay, how you deal with these batteries if they catch fire uh, or if there is a fire in the building itself. So we participated among eight other companies. One of them uh, was number one globally. And as you can see, uh, only uh, two uh, companies that uh, uh, the batteries couldn't, uh, you know, didn't uh, uh, you know, explode or didn't catch any fire. So we were among top two in terms of the safety. And, and that's obviously third party data. So, so all that said, uh, uh, now, uh, you know, the question is uh, first where we are in, in our journey. Uh, I think I would like to highlight that a little bit. Uh, we gave an indication that we are working on a, a factory in New York, but in parallel, we are developing a site. Uh, in fact, that's also a very advanced project in Australia. Uh, that's 15 gigawatt hour. Uh, we have been given a lot of incentives and we have already uh, some investment that uh, has gone to the project. So it's, it's again advanced stage project. We're also looking into, uh, you know, replicating what we are building in Andicott in Germany and Asia as well. So, so there's a lot that is happening by 2025. We are hoping that we'll be at 50 gigawatt hour. Uh, very ambitious program as uh, Professor rightly said, but I think uh, I would say, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't attribute that to technology or us. I think it's the timing. So the timing is perfect. The, the growth is uh, kind of exploding right now uh, in Asia, in, in Europe, as well as in the US, uh, simply because of electro, electro mobility. So uh, with that, uh, I think, uh, uh, let me give a quick flavor of, of, of our New York project. Uh, as my title rightly mentioned, it's a collaborative approach. Uh, I think so far it sounds like we are doing everything, but that's not true. It's, it's uh, all our partners that, that bring a uh, lot of expertise, uh, right from the Siemens to cell guard world that supply component. And we have uh, one of our local partner right from Ithaca, it's called Primate, that supports us on, on the cathode side. But as you can see, there are various companies from New York and overseas that are part of it. I can't disclose certain names, so there are 45 plus companies in our supply chain. Uh, the way we have built the supply chain, 95% of them are not dependent on on jurisdictions that control today's market. So that's evolving and creating that supply chain, which is uh, not a jurisdiction dependent is crucial because that's how, how you de-risk the market growth. You, you need to have always one or two suppliers to supply your components. So when, when uh, you're building electric car, you don't want to be de dependent on just one battery supplier. So I think that's where we see the potential. So it's not just a new technology, it's a new supply chain. And, and some of the members in the supply chain, as you can see, are not just another startup. We have brought uh, very well established uh, deep pocket companies. And these companies make billions of dollars of revenue. So some selected one here are starting from 58 billion to, to some $20 million for a small component is significant size. So uh, today, if you look at the value chain, how lithium ion batteries produce, where the material comes from and where it goes. Uh, from uh, extreme left, the inorganic ores is the mining industry where whether it's a lithium or the transient metals that uh, are taken out from the mine, has to undergo certain refinement processes. Then it is converted into cathode anode material uh, that then uh, eventually build into batteries and used in, in so system here is could be electric car or a microgrid or home storage. Uh, then the new trend that is coming up because of the nature of lithium and battery where it still has a lot of uh, capacity left after losing 30 or 40 percent of the original capacity, it could be used as a second life or we call it post retirement life where it could be used in different applications. And then uh, the good part about lithium ion again, 90, 95 percent of the component can be recycled. So you're not talking about uh, huge landfill after 10 years, it's everything could be recycled. And this is where majority of the new economies, the, the emerging countries are very interested. Right now, if you look at countries like, like India, where $100 billion they spend importing oil. And that, you know, every year that burns into carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. On the other hand, if you import $100 billion worth of batteries, at, at some point you can completely recycle it. So once the ecosystem, domestic ecosystem, develop, you can pretty much recycle. So it becomes a closed loop uh, economy. And that's where majority of the emerging countries looking into lithium ion battery as a substitute to their, uh, their future energy needs um, and substitute to diesel and petrol. So uh, with that, as you can see, it's very, you know, I tried to simplify it, but it's very, very complicated supply chain um, if, if we dig deeper in each components. Um, and what is required and everything is, is possible. I mean, you can put money, you can put technology, but I think uh, in each step in the process, what you require is people, smart people, bringing improvement in efficiency, bringing new technologies that can bring economic benefit, that can uh, improve the performance. If you want to go from uh, 200 miles in one charge to 500 
miles one charge, uh, machines wouldn't deliver it. Uh, you know, intelligent people can do it, and it, it has happened many times in, in the history how we have made improvement from uh, 80 kilowatt hours to, to now 300 kilowatt hours, sorry, uh, watt hours per kg. Uh, it can eventually can you know achieve 500 uh, watt hour per kg in next, let's say, 10 years. I think that will be a perfect uh, battery for, for all our needs. So, that said, there are certain innovations that uh, uh, has been uh, integrated in our system. We, we talk about inline integration, uh, uh, you know, autonomy in, in the factory. So, it's a, so, it's no more a factory. We, we, we look at it as a machine uh, and there are, uh, there are various components in this, this, this machine where uh, if we bring um, the, the knowledge of, uh, let's say, industrial engineering or mechanical engineering, uh, the, the automation, the robotics, all that uh, we have been working with various vendors that, that we have achieved certain milestones already and, and I think with the, with the first factory we will be able to demonstrate that next year. Uh, now, because C4V is a technology company, so C4V obviously uh, is one of the major equity holder in the manufacturing entity, but our key focus when, when our scientists uh, or uh, you know all our engineers working in the lab, our focus is not manufacturing alone. Our focus is how we can bring improvement, how we can be at the forefront of the technology development. So, see our first generation, the BMLMP just that I just showed you has energy density around 215 watt hour per kg, but then we are also working on our next gen our, and we have been able to produce some commercial size cells for our next generation technology, which is uh, no cooling required up to 65 degree centigrade. So, if you eliminate the thermal management system in your electric car, uh, less moving parts, less maintenance, more reliability, also less cost. So, so that is where we are heading, uh, working with few OEMs, uh, the car, global car manufacturers that are kind of uh, providing us the insight in terms of what they want in, in two year, five year, ten year time frame uh, in their technology roadmap. So, we try to sync our development with, with the market. Uh, we are also looking at the generation 3, which is uh, I have written solid state battery, but it is more like a semi solid, but, but more towards solid. So, it has very less liquid in it, uh, maybe 20 percent electrolyte uh, at this stage, the way we have developed it. Uh, the goal is to eliminate the complete liquid if possible, but at this stage it does not look like it is doable unless we sacrifice the low temperature uh, energy density. So, uh, I think. Uh, we, uh, we in, in our collaborative approach, we also want to be home for new technologies as well as new suppliers. So, we have demonstrated it and, and we welcome that always. Uh, here is the summary slide. Um, so, uh, as I said, IP, IP is not just always about molecules and, and protecting those molecules. It's, it's, it's also, it goes deeper than that. Uh, we, we include uh, our experience, our infrastructure, our know-how, our connections, everything under, under IP. Uh, may, I don't know if that's the right definition, but but we think that's important when we when we work with our partners to scale a technology. All these ingredients help you uh, scale faster. We are also looking at some economic growth in the region. So at 15 gigawatt hour 2025, uh, we're talking about 1,800 direct jobs, uh, about 3,000 indirect. That's uh, that's the supply chain job. So that's another thing we have commitment from all our component supplier that the moment we exceed 3 gigawatt hour. They will start setting up their factories uh, in close proximity. So we will we'll be seeing a lot of factories moving here. Uh, eventually, if you are able to uh, pull this whole project together, um, again, uh, supply chain is crucial, and supply chain I think is for us uh, um, has been one of the priority. And and supply chain goes beyond just components or machinery. I think uh, having a, a, an ecosystem uh, supply chain of the intellectual knowledge is what we focus. We work with, we have hired students from Cornell, we have hired from Binghamton University. So, we, we would like to work with smart people and obviously, I would welcome uh, any of you interested in, in, in battery space and want to pursue this as a career. I am happy to discuss opportunities that we have open today or, or will be opening up in next 12 months. Uh, that said, uh, I am also working with the, with the Binghamton University where we can convert some of the uh, PhD thesis into a startup. So, it, it goes beyond just our ecosystem or our product. I think we are looking into how we can also develop uh, an entrepreneurship uh, environment around us. So, whatever we have learned, how we can pass it on to other people and, and share and, and, uh, and lithium ion is one, but there are many other components, many other technologies available. So, whatever we could uh, help with, uh, uh, you know, we always welcome that discussion as well. 
with that uh, we keep charging ahead welcome your questions thank you Yeah, so the post retirement life, there are two aspects to it. One is the, um, so basically um, what happens when your battery uh, used in electric car or bus, uh, the life is considered, you have to discard them the moment your capacity goes down maybe about 80 percent or 70 percent depending upon which, which device we are talking about. So which means if you start with 100 kilowatt hour you still can store 70 kilowatt hour in those batteries. But as your range get reduced or, or some other performance goes down, uh, they have to replace it. And at that point, that 70 percent capacity can be used in applications where weight does not matter, where volume does not matter. And that, that includes uh, a microgrid or grid storage, where you have a lot of land available uh, next to your solar, po solar power plant. You can install those batteries. And 70 percent, as I said, is if you use 80 percent DOD of a 70 percent battery, is still better than a brand new lead acid, which is today that people use. So, so you're talking about replacing it, uh, replacing it with a second-hand product, but still getting you the same performance or better performance than a brand new other technology. And that's where most of the batteries are used. Now, what is also happening is a process called remanufacturing. So, in remanufacturing, what happens? Uh, in a Tesla car, if you, if you open up the battery, there are 7,000 capsules, right, the 18650. So when battery dying uh, in a, and it is like at 70 percent of its capacity, it is not that every cell is behaving the same way. A good portion of that cell or, or, or the group of those cells, let us say 20 percent is still very high performance. And what remanufacturing is about taking those good components and building a brand new new battery again. So that is another process that is happening. So, second life is one and then remanufacturing another one before it goes for recycling. Ho hope this answers your question. Yeah. So, this yeah. is, thank you for yeah. this very exciting talk. So, I have so many questions, but Professor Archer will not let me ask one well, or you couple. Have one shirt, so you could yeah, I can't make it today. Oh, but uh, so, the first part was, I am wondering what market you are really focusing on. I mean, you've got this huge sort of potential at, at a very large stationary system. Yeah. And you've got all these little devices. It seems like at the large system, there may be more competition from other battery types, like flow batteries, for example. So, yeah. is there a, a, a focus that you're going to go on? There's lots of people in the car battery business. That's what I'd worry about, that you might have a tougher time of it there, whereas your other markets might be better. I'm sure you've thought this through, but. Yes, yeah, so basically um, that's right. So th we we have our own strategy to uh, yeah. to enter the market, and there are some low hanging fruits that we are targeting. Uh, obviously, automotive or electric car is not the the first target for us. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I think when we started uh, three years back, we were looking into cell tower market. So cell towers is you know it's a mini uh, replica of a grid, and cell tower is pr primarily dominated by diesel engines. And diesel engine transport of these diesel engines, where the expansion of cell towers happening in emerging countries, well, mostly. The backup system is diesel yeah. Program, but they're on the grid, most of them for sure. No, the expansion. In fact, if you look at the five million uh, grids that install in last five years, uh, almost sixty percent of them are off grid. Completely. Yeah. Completely off grid. So. Forty thousand or so that are there that we know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm market. not just talking about the U.S. market, and and our it's customer still was. A big market. I'm yeah. Not, so if you, if you look at the Africa, for example, they, they are, they are, there are villages, there are towns where there is no electricity, but they have everyone got the cell phone. Sure, sure. So, so these cell phones uh, are basically hooked to the diesel engine. Uh, and the diesel, ca transporting diesel to that place, and there is a lot of theft happen, the, the, the safety aspect. Uh, it's very expensive. Absolutely. So we did an economical study with our first customer. They were saving about 70 percent of the cost uh, over 10 year time frame, replacing diesel engine with batteries. So that's how. We have some strategy where we can target, even in automotive, we are targeting low speed vehicle, uh, you know, where penetration is quicker. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have a question about the battery management system. Is that something that you guys are doing here locally, or is that something that one of your partners is doing? 
So, we have uh, some IP on, on battery management system, uh, but we are working with partners because we do not want to solve all the problems ourselves. So, we have a local partner about two, one hour from here, they have manufacturing plant uh, to produce all the PCB boards. So, they have surface bound, you know, all the infrastructure to do uh, pick and place manufacturing. So, we work with them. Then, we also work with the company from Asia, uh, from Europe, they supply us BMS. Uh, again, because our goal is not to get into car manufacturing, so what we do is we test battery, we, we test it with different BMS and then have customer deal with the BMS manufacturer directly uh, and we supply sales. So, it's a question that is a kind of a follow up on Jeff's question. So, um, so, you mentioned the word supply chain a lot, but then in detail I think there is a bit of a conundrum, right? So, on the one hand, a drop in solution is something that um, is the easiest path to market, but it's not a differentiator, right? It means that you're going to be in competition intensely with places all over the world, and I'm still struggling with the why New York. So yeah. I, you know, I looked at slide 31. I don't know that I thought that was the most interesting slide. Uh, well, there were lots, but that was an interesting <laughs> slide for me <laughs> because the one piece that I felt would um, make New York an, uh, a unique play was this idea of the closed cycle. Yeah, that, yeah, right? right. That, 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 that was my next yeah, question. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> but but, the, but the, the part that closes the cycle were all dash, dash lines. So it means that you know this wasn't perhaps part of the um, supply chain analysis that you've done. So I'm, I'm struggling with the why New York. How do you differentiate? Yep. In fact, this is always my second slide when I present why New York, and I, and I simply reply it why, with why not New York, because uh, there, there's, there, obviously the, the lithium ion is sunrise industry of tomorrow. It's, we are not talking about five years back. The industry has changed drastically in the last two years. China has doubled their capacity in two years. Uh, it's amazing. The way the, the, the explosion is happening is, is like practically sometimes lo looks like impossible, but it's happening. It's, it's the, the numbers are real. So that said, um, we we wanted to build something somewhere where the capital investment is not the the key challenge. I mean, it's always it, you require a lot of capital to do it. But we are looking at how to de-risk and how to get the capital that's uh, more friendly capital available, right? So so if you look at the Huron campus that we have selected for our site, so we're not talking about a greenfield projects. We're not talking about you know having a hundred million dollar building and and then the infrastructure because infra infrastructure is more expensive than the building itself. Whether it's a utility uh, network, whether it's a recycling. Uh, getting all the compliances, environmental clearances in, and obviously that also connect to your chemicals you will be using, but the, this, the, the, uh, the campus has to be uh, designated for chemical handling. So, now the question is, you know, okay, that can be done in China or that can be done in so India as well, so right? You're doing one in Australia, one in Asia, one in Germany. Yeah. But presumably that equation works yeah. in many places. Yeah, yeah, and and why we are starting here is obviously first we are we are located here. The, the, the you know all the all the people involved in the project in the technology, the the challenges we have solved are local. So it will be very difficult for me to take those group of those 15 people from here to to Australia and build. So practically, it makes sense to do it here from technology perspective. Now from supply chain and manufacturing perspective, we have brought experts. We have we have our, our one of our uh, chief operating officer. He worked with GM, bringing GM's fuel cell vehicle from literally from papers to to, to reality. So, you know, th th there's a lot of know-how. Uh, the other reason is, if you look at this whole area, uh, from Binghamton to Rochester to Ithaca and, and, and the Corning, uh, within one and two hour distance, uh, we have companies from, from Corning to, to, we had Kodak, Xerox, you know, Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, all these billion dollar companies that exist here. Uh, if you go into core of those technologies, uh, pretty much most of the companies handle powder, you know, start with powder and lithium and battery is powder. So, handling powder, handling materials is key and that knowledge base exists here. And we, we were able to retrofit Kodak coating lines they were using for photography film to, to produce our electrodes. That is just an example. We did not have to like raise 100 million dollar and, and set up a pilot facility. We were able to use what exists around us and produce our prototype without raising any millions of dollars. So, so that is you know compatible existing infrastructure is one thing then uh, the expertise, the know-how, the people who understand manufacturing. Manufacturing is very different from R&D. So, having them on board, uh, the people who know how to execute is also equally important. So, identifying those people, they all exist here. Um, and uh, ethically, uh, sustainable and ethical supply chain. 
So, we have looked into the supply chain all the components. Uh, in addition to that, I, I, we see that New York is going to be our primary market. So, it is not just about the people, it is not just about the technology. In fact, right here, in, uh, and, uh, as per Governor Kumo's announcement, we will, we will be installing almost 2.5 gigawatt hour in the next, next 5, 6 years. So, our factory would be kind of sufficient enough to, to meet our local demand, just New York State, forget about other states and, and other, the whole U.S. So, one quick Yeah, so I think the the uh, the second and and third point. So they had a lot of money. They had they even have so had some technology. They didn't have their own technology that uh, will bring drastic improvement. They had electrolyte uh, technology that to me was uh, is, is is still very challenging because it's, it disrupt the manufacturing. So disrupting the supply chain was one problem. Then all their management, the core team. Uh, I I don't know if they had anyone from lithium and battery background, uh, and it's very very compli complicated manufacturing. So I think these were the two or three examples we, we thought probably were the reason. All right, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for the article. Thanks for having me.